What's happening, everybody? Welcome back to the show. Welcome to BD4, episode 435 of the podcast. I am your host, RJ Carbone, and you are listening to episode 435. Yes, welcome to BD4, where there's no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. We also do MMA now, too. Yanks every series, Knicks every game, MMA on occasion. If you haven't checked out episode 434, definitely check that out. We recapped UFC 281, which took place on Saturday night. Um, As I'm recording, it's already Wednesday. Jeez, time's flying by. It's Christmas time. It's officially Christmas time. As soon as you get to, like, Thanksgiving, it's going to be officially Christmas time. Um, So it's cold out. And I'm recording this episode after the Knicks bounced back and took a win. Um, They took a win late last night to begin their West Coast trip, hence the episode. The Knicks start off the West Coast trip with a win. Um, So it's Wednesday, November 16th. As I am recording, it's the uh, the day right after the Knicks picked up a win against the Utah Jazz. Um, so let's talk. Let's talk about it. Let's go over this win. We got a lot to unpack in this episode. Um, so let's. Yeah, it, it was. We'll, we'll, we'll get into it all in a second. Let's get to the intro, and um, yeah, let's do it. Let's get right to the intro. We'll get going. Welcome to BD4, an RJ Carbone podcast. BD4, where there is no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. We also do MMA. Yanks every series, Knicks every game, MMA on occasion. BD4 is a five-star show on Apple Podcasts, also available in video format on YouTube and Spotify. So thanks for stopping by, and we hope you enjoy the show. Champion of the world, turning, looking, see ya! Anthony for three, bang! That one goes down and the game is tied! Time! Time! Penetrate, creates, and showing some dexterity as well with the left hand. Uh, 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 Yankees win! All right. We're back. Welcome to the show. Again, welcome to BD4. Welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, RJ. If you are new here to the podcast, welcome to the show. Thanks for stopping by. You can find BD4 on many different platforms. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts um, and download the episodes there. And if you do that, be sure to give us a five-star rating and review because we're currently a five-star podcast and would like to keep it that way. Um, what else? You can watch the podcast. The video format is on YouTube and Spotify. You can also listen to it on Spotify, of course, and many other platforms. Uh, If you want to find me on social media, you can find me on Facebook at BD4, on Twitter at BD4Pod, and on Instagram at Rob J. Carbone. Instagram at Rob J. Carbone. So, let's have more team meetings. More team dinners, please. It seems to have worked. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Every time, like, a sports team is struggling and they do one of those, and, like, the fans will always cling to it as, like, the, the, this team is so-and-so since the meeting or since Aaron Boone slammed his hand on the table. You know, it's funny. But, yeah, 1-0 and since the big team dinner. Um, but it was a big win. You know, the Knicks needed that. It was a big win in Utah last night to start off a West Coast trip. Utah is a very solid, overachieving team so far this year. Um, they're very hot right now. They they came into this night undefeated at home. Um, a great offensive team. I believe they're the number one number one scoring team, which is impressive given that they don't have a superstar. They all just spread it around. Um, must be nice. Um, but, yeah, the Knicks clamped down last night. They kept their offense strong, of course, and they won. Uh, The fourth quarter was the difference in this game. Um, It was close the entire way, 
But the Knicks came into the fourth quarter down 87 to 83. And to me, I thought that was a big difference uh, as soon as quickly started getting gone. So they're down by four points. Quickly starts sparking him with a steal. He lays it up. And then he knocks down two consecutive triples a little bit later to make it 94-89 Knicks. So from down four points, they go up five points. And that's when Brunson starts to get really hot and he kind of put the game away. He eventually stretches the Knicks run and makes it 99-89 overall. And he scores 12 points in the final seven or so minutes of the fourth quarter. Brunson does. So the Knicks win 118-111 over the Utah Jazz in Salt Lake City last night. Brunson gets 25. Cam Reddish gets 19. Reddish had a good game. Um, RJ scored 18. Wasn't great, but he scored 18. Randall, I think, had uh, did he have 18 as well. Uh, quickly, Obi, Sims, each in double figures off the bench. I thought it was a good win, but the defense, man. That's what it was. Last night, it was the defense for the Knicks. That is what won them this game. Um, I thought they were closing out much quicker on the perimeter. And that's obviously a big problem for them this year. Um, but they were much sharper on their closeouts. The rotations were crisp. Um, the effort was certainly there. The communication was there. The scheme was the same. They, they didn't really mix it up. Which, okay. You know, no, no zoning. Nothing really different. It was the same man-to-man drop coverage. Collapse to paint coverage. But the effort. That was the difference. It was the effort. They were much sharper, much quicker, and they were moving around. Um, Emmanuel quickly has become a very solid, underrated defensive player. Jericho Sims was great at the rim last night. Brunson was putting in effort, but how about Cam Reddish? I want to talk about Cam. Um, now, Cam Reddish, he didn't win any award. He's not going to. He didn't win any Bing Bong game balls, but. I just want to talk about him because he's obviously one of my favorite players since they traded for him. Do you guys remember in the preseason when um, we were discussing? It was like it might have been one of the first episodes, or it might have been the preseason episode. I don't know, but we were discussing Obi and discussing Cam Reddish, and said that the only way that Cam gets more minutes. Is if he plays defense this year. He's really got to put an effort there. And his motor can't be a problem anymore defensively. Well he's clearly worked on it. He worked on it over the summer obviously. Uh, the effort's there. The defense is there. I mean he's he's played such good solid wing defense this year for the Knicks. And that's such a valuable asset to have itself. He's just. he's a, We really talk about this too much. But he's extremely long. He's got the wingspan, the height, so he's able to deny the ball, deflect the the ball, play the passing lanes consistently. And we saw that last night. He's got the size to do you up in man-to-man coverage. He's he's good, man. He's a good defensive player. Did he have a uh, a few mishaps in the third quarter defensively? Yeah, probably more than a few. Um, the, uh, his closeouts weren't sharp to, to start the half. He had a few moments later in the third. But overall, I thought he played really great defense. And that's exactly why he's been playing every single night for 25 minutes or so. Because he's playing defense. Um, and the offense hopefully is starting to come around. Hopefully. He's scoring lately. 26 points against OKC. 19 points last night against Utah. He started slow early first quarter. I think he was I think he missed maybe four of his first five shots. Um, but I like that that didn't really deter him. And the Knicks just kept feeding him after and then he got hot. You know, he's either gonna go to the rack and he'll get there and he'll do it quickly. Or he's gonna be shooting that spot up corner three pointer. The Knicks like the corner three. It's a Tibbs thing. A lot of the guys, if you watch, will shoot those corner threes. Um, But he was getting to the rack with these, as he always does. He's just uh, two steps and he's there. Um, Big strides. And he's athletic. 
but he was engaged. He looked engaged last night. He was moving off of the ball, making mm-hmm. good cuts. He was demanding the ball last night, which was good. You know, we saw him demand it again when Julius was hogging it. Um, but he was great. 19 points, shot 7 of 13, 2 of 5 from 3, 3 of 3 at the free throw line, and obviously he knocked down two big free throws in clutch, in, uh, clutch time, crunch time. But, yeah, I like that he's playing within the offense right now, um, and I think that's key, right? And you're seeing Tibbs show even more trust in Cam Reddish lately. He got 33 minutes in OKC. Um uh, against OKC. I think that was a home game. And then he got 33 minutes last night. And, you know, we even saw him stay on the floor last night when the starters came out. Brunson and RJ were pulled. And it was IQ, D Rose, Cam, Randall, and Sims. So we saw him get some minutes with some of the bench unit. Um, so that tells you. Uh, Tibbs wants to see him, you know, he's getting extended minutes. He wants to see him with other lineups. and So I think if Cam keeps playing defense, and again, I've said this, but it doesn't have to be 20 points a night. But if he keeps playing defense, if he plays D on the wings and just does his thing out there on that end of the floor, and maybe he knocks down a three or two, plays the break a few times, scores at the rim, you got yourself a solid, not just a solid rotational player, but maybe a solid starter. Maybe that can be a thing. Maybe he can stay in this lineup, even when Grimes is healthy. And that's great to see for me, man. Because I had no confidence that this guy would even crack the rotation earlier in the year. Do you remember when we did our um, preseason numbers projections? Like we projected the stat lines and made our predictions and stuff. I was saying I think I'm going to see Cam get... I want to see Cam do 15 points per game. And I was laughing about it. I did that in a joking manner, kind of, because I was like, I I really want it to happen, but I don't think it's going to happen because I don't think he's going to play. And he's not. He, you know, on the air, he's up to nine points. But I didn't think he'd get anything because I didn't think he'd crack the rotation. I didn't think there'd be a shot. But it's funny how things work out. Um, But yeah, he's having himself a nice year. Um, he's up to nine points per game now. He's shooting 45% from the field. I think that's a career high. 34% from three. 89% from the free throw line. Um, a steal a game. A block a game. And he's got a positive number in the box score. So, I, I think he's in, man. I think it's looking good for him. I mean, Fournier is cooked. That guy's Nick career is over. Um, he'll be nothing but a reserve with, with maybe sporadic minutes until he's moved. And obviously you've got time with Grimes still working his way back, but you can fit them both in. And so if Cam keeps producing, he will stay in there, I think. Uh, I think he's going to stay in there. And hopefully, 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 this is something that is a year-long thing and it can get himself an extension. Um but that's a whole different story there because the Knicks have some decisions to make eventually. You know, Cam is, is his contract is up at the end of the year. Emmanuel quickly is due for that extension. So is Obi Toppin. You got to figure out what you want to do with Julius because that will domino affect other things. You can't keep all these kids. You know, you're going to hit the cap. You, you better not be doing, you, you're not going to sign all these guys because it's going to take up a ton of cap. You're not doing all, all that all that with role players. So there may have to be some signing trades in there. I don't know. But I am a huge Cam guy. That's one thing I know. And I, I do want him around in the future. So I am pulling for him. Um, and I think if he keeps playing well, maybe good things are in his, his future in the uh, in the summer. Um, Emmanuel quickly. I feel like I snubbed him from getting a bing-bong ball. Um just because I wanted to give it to somebody else uh, who we'll get to in a bit. But quickly last night, another great night. Um, 13 points, 5 for 10 from the floor, 3 of 6 from the arc, 2 assists, no turnovers, and 4 steals. Very efficient all around. He was knocking down open 3-pointers, thank God. Um, Had some good playmaking in there with Sims. There was that one play he was 
dribbling out the shot clock with his offhand and then found Sims for that lob last minute. Last second as the clock wore down. But his scoring output in the fourth quarter was significant to this win. His, his Really, his play on both ends at the beginning of that fourth quarter was significant. He helped change the momentum, which a lot of games this year, if the Knicks have a lead and they blow that lead, even if it's a small lead they blow, it turns into a blowout loss, right? So I think quickly was the key last night and not letting that happen. How many times have we seen this year where the Knicks have themselves a lead by two or three points and they have it for a little bit, but as soon as that other team makes a small run, they go up by three, then it's five, then it's nine, and it keeps going up and up, and before you know it, they're down double figures, they're down 20-something points. That didn't happen because I, I quickly, I really want to stress that quickly was the reason for that last night, early fourth quarter, if you go back and watch. Um, and his, again, his defense is just very underrated. It's improved, and he's become a good defender. Uh, he stays in front of his man, and he makes his guy work. He's got very quick hands. He could just be this pest out there sometimes. So the four steals last night were great. Um, I just hope this stays offensively. I don't have a ton of confidence at Will because IQ is a guy who has hot streaks, and to me they come far and few between. He's very streaky. Um, he's he's inefficient, and he's not really showing a ton of signs that he'll improve his efficiency. Uh, I do know that he's young, and he can improve because he's young, but he's also a 25 a number 25 pick, you know, so I, it wouldn't shock me if he if he turned out to be just a little bit better than he is now, but nothing outstanding. Um, lately, though, I'll give him his credit. He's been much more efficient. The last five games here quickly, he shot 47% or better in four of them. Um, so I thought quickly was great. Um, I liked what Tom Thibodeau was doing last night. I got to give him credit. I'm not going to complain too much, okay? Um... I enjoyed seeing him tighten up the rotation. He cut it from 10 men to 9 men last night. Fournier, after inexcusably playing 20 minutes to close the OKC game, gets a DNP last night. Um, Quinton Grimes didn't play, but I still think they're kind of load managing his minutes. Um, it might be a while, it's looking like. Um, but shortened up the rotation last night. That's a win for me. The defense was much better. That's all we were asking for, the effort. Uh, so credit to him. Credit to Tibbs. But I, there is a but in there. There's always going to be a but with Tom Thibodeau. If this wasn't a game that tells you Obi Toppin will never, ever play, then I do not know what that game will be. Um, and again, going back to our point about the preseason, we were saying that with Obi... It's defense and rebounding that's going to have to earn Tibbs' trust. Well, Obi played, you know, he has played solid help defense all year, I think. And last night, he rebounded the ball six times. And on top of that, he had four assists. And oh, he was three for four from deep, he had nine points. And, oh, a game-high plus 23 in the box score. Oh, and Randall was not great last night. Hartenstein was not good either. So, it's like, what the hell does Obi Toppin have to do at this point? Because he did all the things he usually does. He scored, he knocked down his shots, and he even defended. But in addition to that, he rebounded last night. He rebounded. He was jumping for them. And that is what Tibbs is looking for. But still, he earned just 18 measly minutes. I don't get it. I don't understand it. I need to know why. I need to know why. It's so overwhelming and frustrating to me. Because I'm sure there is some reason. But it's like, what could that reason be? Because I, mean, I feel like I've thought through all the reasons and I can't find a rational one. I mean, I'm listening to these podcasts last night, these Knicks live streams and radio shows, trying to figure out what it is. Because if I can't understand it, then certainly they can, because they have much more knowledge than I do. No, 
these people are just as confused as I am. Maybe he needs to rebound well more consistently. But then that goes back to what we, we usually talk about with selective accountability, right? Because Obi still makes a positive impact towards winning, usually, when he's out on the floor. So, like, if it's rebounding, then why is Randall still allowed to get free reign when he's walking it up the court and getting his cookies stolen from behind? Or he's driving into traffic right into a block. Both of those instances happened last night. I just don't understand the hypocrisy. Because at the end of the day, Obi is the more efficient basketball player. Is Randall the better player? Sure. But being more talented doesn't always mean you're contributing towards winning more than the other guy. And Obi, I think, is getting 17 minutes per game on the year. I'm not saying he needs to get Randall's 35 and have Randall sit all night. No, that's ridiculous. It will never happen. But there are instances where I feel like you can play them together. And I feel like Tibbs has gone away from that more lately. He's not really done the small ball these last few games. But there are also instances, like I said, when Randall should be held accountable and sent to the bench for a few minutes and Obi should get a crack. I don't know, man. It just doesn't feel right to me. Um, it, it's the dude. He's so efficient. He's a sixty percent shooter. Uh, I think he's shooting fifty this year, but because he's shooting more threes. But he's making his three point shot now. He's playing defense. It just it shouldn't have to be. He has to be perfect just for him to get twenty five minutes. It's insane. It's like a pitcher. It's like if you had a pitcher out there, a starting pitcher. And he won six innings, one run. And he was like, and he was pulled with with 70 pitches after six innings. Because he gave up that run in the sixth inning. It's like, really? It, it's really like what Boone does with everybody. But it's like, it, it's like he has to be perfect. He has to throw a shutout just to, for him to get that seventh inning. That's what I feel like with Obi Toppin. He can't do a single thing wrong. Despite, even if he does one thing wrong, he's still contributing very positively th towards winning. Ah, oh, man, I, I am... It, it, at some point, they gotta make a decision here what they wanna do. Do you wanna ride this out with Randall? Because it's it's not gonna change. His play style is what it is. He's not gonna be this guy that we all want off the ball and, and taking a step back. He's gonna, he's gonna try to do the point Randall thing still. He is who he is. And at the end of the day, his numbers are there for sure. 25-10-3. But if you watch him, 20, 10, and 3. But if you watch him, he's clearly a give and take type of player. Right? It's either defense that, that's pulling his performance back a bit, it's the turnovers, it's missing missing shots. It's always something that really takes it down a lot. Um, so do you live with that and hope that he can become better and be part of this future? I don't know. If so, then you're stunting the development of Obi Toppin. Because if they they're gonna have to move on from one because Obi is a talented kid, he's their number eight pick in the draft. They spent an entire season tanking so they could get a high pick, and their high pick was Obi Toppin. So should they move Randall so they could free up minutes for Obi Toppin and let him shine? I don't. Know, it, it's because at the same time, I I, I I don't know how great Obi is, but it's like can we at least find out? But I think Randall's here. I don't think they're moving Randall. I think it's, it's, I don't know. I really can't tell, but it's, it's hard. Cause I go back and forth. I'm like, cause Randall, I, I do feel like has had a good year, a better year, but you could be using that money in other areas. And I feel like you, you should be giving Obi his free reign. I feel like he could become a better player. His numbers could become very similar. Um, I just, it's hard to tell because he doesn't get the time to really show it consistently in that sample. Um, let's go to our, let's get to our first award winner. Let's get to our winner of the Bing Bong ball. Who gets a Bing Bong ball off the bench? We'll start with the bench. That's going to be Jericho Sims. Bing Bong! 
I think that Sims. My, oh, here we go. Okay. I thought he was great last night. 11 points, 13 rebounds, two assists, a steal, five for seven. He missed his first two shots of the season last night. Uh, but he was just a force in the paint, a force, um, protecting the rim with eight offensive rebounds last night. So just giving the Knicks second chance opportunity after second chance opportunity, which allowed the Knicks to continuously attack the paint um, with confidence knowing that Sims is there against an undersized Jazz front court. The Knicks won the paint 60-40, to 40, and that was a big reason. Um, Sims was a big reason for that. And I just like watching Sims out there much better than I do Isaiah Hartenstein. That kid's just not it to me. He just He's slow. He's soft on the boards. He's just a very underwhelming rebounder, and occasionally he'll throw up that little short floater. But... You put this guy, Hartenstein, in a pick and roll, and he's in a blender. You put a ball handler in front of him, and he goes right by him. You send him to the perimeter to guard, and they go right by him. He's toast. Under the rim, they they score on him. He's not. Where he's not that. He's not a defensive player. Where Sims can leap, and he can do it so quickly, and from any angle, and from any position that he's in. And I think that's what makes him different athletically for Mitch. Um, I wonder if Sims could contribute more offensively if the Knicks involved him more. If he wasn't just a screener out there. If he wasn't just a guy under the, off- under the offensive glass. I wonder if instead of four points tonight, it could maybe turn into seven or eight minute, uh, seven or eight points like, like with Mitch. Because um, I like Mitch, but his shtick kind of gets tiring. Know, he's always hurt, and he's never really given you enough consistency. Um, so Jericho Sims, I thought, definitely deserved a Bing Bong ball last night. Also deserving of it was Bing Bong. Um, Jalen Brunson last night was just great. Again, a very easy twenty-five and eight. He shot the ball fifty percent, three steals. Uh, four turnovers, which may have been a season high, which is crazy. But his his bucket getting down the stretch just and making big time plays too. It wasn't just his points. He had four field goals in the fourth quarter. He knocked down four free throws in the fourth quarter, but he also tallied three assists in the fourth quarter, and he had two steals in the fourth. He was fantastic. Now I know the, the whole Brunson ISO thing down the stretch is interesting to some fans. But sometimes that's what a point guard's got to do. You know, they aren't always going to be Rondo. They're not just going to pass it all the time. They're not, you know, they're just not going to distribute for all 48 minutes. I look at point guard like a quarterback, right? Sometimes a quarterback has to scramble out of the pocket when nobody else is open. You had RJ missing easy layups all night, missing free throws. He was off all night. He was sick. I'll give him that. But I certainly didn't trust him. I definitely didn't trust Randall last night with the amount of dumb, unaware turnovers and blocks that he walked right into. I think Brunson is your guy. He's been your most consistent player this season. And so last night he took it upon himself to be the catalyst the catalyst of this offense. And he did his thing. And it worked. It worked again. So, yeah, I had no problem with him going ISO last night late. Um, but yeah, and, and you know, on this whole team dinner thing, I, I, I guess I'll bring it up now. It was funny, man, because not to sound like a conspiracy theorist. Okay. As I proceed to sound like a conspiracy theorist, I do wonder if the whole Randall leading the team dinner was more MSG propaganda, because let's be honest, the MSG propaganda machine has been fully turned on this season. They're, they're singing the whole Randall comeback story. They're talking about him meditating. They're showing him meditating on the bench with the assistant coach, Dice K, whatever, talking in his ear. They're trying to really build up this narrative that Randall has done a complete 180, which I'm not saying he hasn't. He has been better. But I'm wondering if, if he really started this team meeting and it wasn't led by somebody else. I'm just curious. And I'm not, I'm not trying to hate on the guy. 
but I did hear somebody else make that point on a podcast, and I was like, that's a very good point. That's very true. Um, I don't know. But um, all in all, though, it's, you know, the Knicks improved to 7-7 seven and seven on the year. Um, yeah. We'll see what happens next. You got Denver tonight. No Jokic, though. I think he's in COVID protocol, they said. I just, you know, I want them to keep winning, and I want the young guys to keep playing well. Um, listen, because the young guys are playing. Quickly is playing. RJ Barrett is playing. Cam Reddish is now playing. Sims is now playing. It's really just the OB top and thing that frustrates us, but it's hard because Randall's in front of him, and you're not going to sit the guy with the contract. But again, you do wish that you could just shave a few minutes off and hold him accountable here and there. And that's the thing that frustrates a lot of us. So I want them to keep winning. I want the young guys to keep playing well. Um, and I understand that a lot of Knicks fans still want the bill gone. And I understand some of that. I, I do. Obviously, the rotation. Like we say, he, he's just not getting the best with what he has. Right? The record of 7-7, seven of seven and seven, it could very well be 9-5, and 10-4 and four with a few tweaks. Right? That, that's a big difference in the seating. Um, yeah, the selective accountability, I get it. Julius you know, benching RJ the other night when Fournier gets to close with zero points and Obi. And I, I get all that. I understand the frustrations towards the defense. Their defensive scheme hasn't been working, and they still do it maybe without the right personnel for it. Tibbs is a defensive-minded coach, and his team is out there allowing wide-open three-pointers and wide-open lanes in the paint. I think I saw a stat on Twitter. Was it Tommy Beer? Um, I don't remember what it was, but I think it, I, it was something like the Knicks have allowed the most three-pointers of six feet or, or more of open space. It was absurd. Um, and it's not surprising, because if you watch the team, they really, really do it a lot more than other teams. Um and I get the offense can maybe be frustrating at times. Tibbs has them shooting a lot of threes with a lack of personnel to do that. Um, and obviously the problem with all these missed threes is they lead to long rebounds and uncontested fast break looks, which have been a problem for the Knicks. Even last night, I didn't think the fast break defense was good last night for the Knicks. They struggled in the fast break. Um, now, I don't know if I buy that the team stopped defending because of coaching. That they gave up on him. At least I didn't after OKC. I still didn't buy into that narrative. It's hard to tell things like that. But then you saw the players only dinner happened. And maybe there is something. Because that stuff usually spells bad things for Knicks coaches. Um, in the past it has. With Woodson, with Fisdale. That's happened. Well, they were canned not too long after players only meetings. Um, I... Again, though, with, with that all said, though, at the same time, I just look at this roster construction and I just don't think it's that good. He doesn't have a ton to work with, Tibbs. Like, defense is supposed to be their strength and identity, but you gave him all these offensive-minded players, for the most part. You know, he wants to shoot more threes, but you didn't really give him any three-point shooters on the roster. You just gave him a bunch of slashers. I just feel like if they were to make a coaching change right now, the next coach will come in here, and I would like it to be Johnny Bryant as much as, as many of you do. But I feel like he'll come in here, he'll win maybe 6 of 10, 7 of 10. Knicks fans will get excited. You know, they'll start changing, you know, doing that narrative of, the Knicks are, you know, seven and three since the coaching change and all that, but it will eventually end up the same scenario where the roster just simply isn't good enough to go further than cracking the play in at most. So I look at it as the front office is the main problem. First and foremost, they did all this. They had more cap space than any other franchise in 2021. And what did they do with it? They spent 200 plus million dollars on Derek Rose Evan Fournier, Alec Burks, Kemba Walker, Taj Gibson, and Nerlens Noel. $200 million on all those role players and vets. 
Now, almost a year later, the Knicks had to attach draft picks, valuable draft picks, just to dump the contracts of Burks, Noel, Kemba, and let's be honest, most likely they're going to be doing the same with Fournier soon and maybe even Derrick Rose, who knows what the whole thing with his minutes. And next year, you're $40 million over the cap. So the front office is really, really in a, per, in a predicament here. Is that the right word? Where they got to figure out what they're going to do. Uh, but I think right now you put yourself in this situation to where the best thing you can do is, I think, stay the course, keep trying to win, and let these young players play at the same time, man. You just got to pray that eventually... Because there's a, there's a way to make this Obi randall thing work without moving either right now. Like, I don't think Randall's going to go. I would like to move him, but I don't think he's going to go. And if that's the case, he does stay this year. Then there's a way to still get them both decent playing time. So I think there's a way you try to win and you try to free up Obi his minutes and you keep playing the other kids their run. And you, you, why you do this, you just pray that eventually the next disgruntled star becomes available and the Knicks attach some of these young players and, and bad veteran contracts and, and, and draft picks to swing a deal for him. And you, you hope that Leon Rose actually does it this time. And you hope that you win enough games this year to become somewhat attractive in the free agent market. But who knows there? That, that we have to see what happens. I don't know, guys. I think I'm going off track. The Knicks win. Let's, uh, let's wrap this up with the question of the day with our parlay. We'll do all that when we get back from break. Stay with us. Be right back. Hey, guys. So if you are a listener of the podcast often and you want to know where to find me on social media, you can find me on Facebook at BD4. You can find me on Twitter at BD4Pod. And you can also find me on Instagram at Rob J. Carbone. BD4 is located on many different platforms. You can listen to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, and if you do there, be sure to give us a five-star rating and review. You can listen to it on Spotify, but you can also watch the podcast on both Spotify and YouTube. BD4 is available on many other platforms as well. All you got to do is search it up. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and much more. Welcome to RJ's Parlay, where my degenerate self breaks down tonight's big parlay. If I miss, it's not surprising. If I hit, I'll probably lose it all the next night, because that's how this works. Welcome to RJ's Parlay. So, last night's parlay, before the Nick game, we had one. It was a four-pick parlay of plus 326 odds. And we finally cashed. We had Barrett. 25 plus points, rebounds, and assists. Just got that last second when he made that. Um, I think he made an assist to get 24 combined, and then he hit a free throw. He knocked out one free throw. I just got that. I think he finished with 25 on the spot. Uh, Brunson, I had over five and a half assists. He finished with eight. He's so consistent. Uh, the Knicks, I had covering the plus 12 and a half alternate spread. It was risky going in, but. No problem doing that. And then I had one on the Nets game. I had Kevin Durant scoring over 25 or 25 or more points. That also hit. So four for four, which means I pick up the win on a plus 326 bet. So that's our parlay for this one. Um, stick around because we'll have them for tonight's 10 p.m. game against the Nuggets as well. Most likely. Um, we're going to double down. All right, let's wrap it up with the uh, question of the day. We'll be right there. We also have a website now for BD4. If you go to bd4blog.com, you can find the blog, the podcast links, and also where to find me on social media. Just go to bd4blog.com. Studio 69 Productions is a podcast production agency created by Leo Rodriguez to allow content creators to market their podcast. It's an online platform 
that will market your podcast or any other project that you're working on. Get in touch with Leo Rodriguez from Studio 69 Productions. You can find Studio 69 Productions on Instagram at Studio69NJ. Studio 69 Productions, where dreams are heard and born. Welcome back to the show, episode 435 of BD4. I am your host, RJ Carbone. So for this episode of the podcast, our NYY, NYK, MMA trivia question of the day is, what's the name of Chris Herring's new book from January 2022 that illustrates the 90s Knicks teams with Riley Ewing, Starks, Oakley, and Mason. All right. What's the name of Chris Herring's new book from January 2022 that illustrates the 90s Knicks teams with Riley, Ewing, Starks, Oakley, and Mason? So let me know what the name of the book is. It's a book that I'm going to ask Santa Claus for this Christmas because I really want to read it. All right. So one last time, what's the name of Chris Ehring's new book from January 2022 that illustrates the 90s Knicks teams with Riley, Ewing, Starks, Oakley, and Mason? Let me know the answer, guys, wherever you can reach me. If you get the answer correct, I'll give you a shout-out in the next episode. If you don't get it correct, but at least attempt to guess the answer, I'll let you know what the answer is via DM in the next show. Thanks, guys, and... um. I will see you either late tonight if I have the energy to uh, record after this late night West Coast game. Um, If not, then I'll see you tomorrow. I'll record it and drop the episode tomorrow um, on Thursday. So thanks, guys, and I'll see you next time. Ciao. Later. This episode was brought to you by Anchor.